Okay. So Osiris Rex is having a live stream uh, today. Actually on NASA TV. No idea who that is. Osiris Rex, it's a asteroid sample return mission. Very cool idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, it's almost like a manned mission, you know? So we're going to dig up some stuff and bring it back. Hey, Jeff. Jeff Wise is on. He says, right now. That's true. It's right now. We have a little Osiris Rex video that we're going to show as well. <clears throat> Bergman Scooter's on with us. Tim Myers is on. Book Davies. I brought this. Uh... The website I brought up is a PBS website. It's got the what? It's got the feed from NASA. It says watch the live. So this is the actual sample collection hmm. on the asteroid. Oh, it's not a simulation. They said it was. No, a it says NASA Osiris Rex spacecraft to collect sample from asteroid Bennu. Uh, watch the sample collection touch and go maneuver Tuesday, October twentieth at five p.m. Right. I'm not getting the stream, the NASA stream down. Not yet. Okay, they're talking about it right now. <clears throat> Marco Pola says, got my order placed for the observatory tent. Can't wait to get it. Also told some members about it at my local astronomy club. So we may get some new Explore Alliance members. Awesome. Ron Delvo says, hello. Stefan says, good morning. Had a nice conversation with Dip, Deepti Gautam. Deepti's in Nepal and a uh, 16 year old uh, high school student. And she is, uh, she belongs to uh, the local astronomy club, or I guess the Nepal Astronomy Club. And uh, she has uh, started an astronomy club in her high school as well. So it's very cool. Good afternoon from Central Oregon, Lapine Observatory. 
his backyard. This is Richard Lighthill. Paul, so cool. Yeah, it is. This uh, global star party that's going to be on tonight is going to be really cool. You're going to like it. As we started to approach Bennu from a distance and it started to fill up the camera field of view, it looked exactly like we thought it would, with a few boulders sticking out. But as we got closer, we expected to see a very sandy surface with maybe a few boulders here and there. And what we saw is very little sand. And we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks, and we saw very few areas that had this sandy surface that we were expecting and what we had designed to. We have never done this before. We're actually going to collect the sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail, and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. Hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and this is the Explore Alliance Presents, a open go-to community. And today with me is Carol Orge, president of the Astronomical League, uh, Jerry Hubble, uh, uh, vice president of engineering, and Tyler Bowman in tech support here at Explore Scientific. And uh, it's an exciting day. Um, uh, we have OSIRIS-REx, um, uh, with a live presentation of, uh, uh, on NASA television. We're actually kind of monitoring it right now, but they're going to do the uh, uh, sample collection. Either, it's either a simulation or maybe it's really happening. Uh, maybe, maybe Jerry can help interpret that a little bit better. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, we're going to start off um, with, uh, with Carol because we have some uh, exciting news and... Um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Carol and John Goss both approached me, and actually I was approached before about um, having Explore Scientific support or underwrite the, uh, the astrophotography program or award contest that you guys have. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, we are very excited indeed. Uh, for years and years, we were trying to get an image uh, award in place because uh, astrophotography, as it evolved, then we were more into the imaging uh, and doing the, the other things that make it truly almost art in so many ways. So we knew there was a, a demand for that. Uh, we had a start, but then uh, we were without a sponsorship. So thanks to Explore Scientific and Scott for uh, agreeing to step forward and sponsor that. Basically, this program will uh, deal with images from the solar system, deep sky, wide field, maybe even some video. And we're real thrilled because wow. uh, it's amazing with all the new advances in technology, uh, amateur astronomers can do what professionals only used to be able to do. So we're very excited to put that in place. We're uh, uh, tweaking the program and finding out exactly the specifics, but we hope to have it announced officially and on the website within the next month or so. so that. Uh, we will be ready uh, after the first of the year for entries. So thanks again, Scott. We really appreciate oh, that venture. Yeah, it's great. We're excited about it, too. We are making astrophotography a uh, more central uh, uh, drive here at Explore Scientific overall. Um, you know, with the problem of uh, light pollution, but also with the advantages of 
uh, narrow band imaging. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that can jump into doing astrophotography, maybe more than ever before, okay? You've got uh, the cameras have, technology has matured, um, the uh, uh, remote, even remote access to telescopes has matured. It's within the grasp now of amateur astronomers where before it was really kind of in the realm of just the elite, the people that could spend a lot of money, okay, to get this done. And uh, now it's becoming something that um, uh, you can have a reasonably modest setup and start to do it. There's still a learning curve, though, and that's, that's where we need the league uh, to help uh, inspire people to push themselves further. I think the contest will do that. Um, you know, hopefully at one point the league has... Um, uh, like your observing programs, maybe there are mentoring programs to uh, uh, increase your knowledge about astrophotography. So I'm excited about those possibilities. Um, we'll certainly be moving in that direction as well, and we're going to do every, everything we can to help support the league in this. So We appreciate that very much. Yeah, that's great. And you guys will be on tonight on the Global Star Party. It's John Goss will be on. Yeah, it'll right? be John Goss. So. Uh, okay. Maybe right. so we, have some, on we have some prizes and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, as as this whole um, uh, program develops for the Astronomical League uh, astrophotography contest and recognition programs uh, progress, we'll we'll keep you aware of that. And um, so it's it's a lot of excitement here, and uh, we're real proud to be part of it. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Carol. Take care. Sure. Take care. All right. All right. All right, so um, we are uh, um, we were looking at some of the uh, NASA uh, stuff um, today uh, with right. uh, Osiris Rex, and uh, for those of you who don't know what Osiris Rex was or is, it is a uh, uh, asteroid uh, sample return mission, and um, so there's been there's a lot of great visualization. I mean, the, the the photography they have from the orbits of of Osiris Rex uh, orbiting uh, 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 asteroid Benno are just stunning, amazing. I'm going to have more of these uh, videos that you can see later on at the Global Star Party. Uh, but um, uh, you know, they are actually NASA television right now uh, is um, they they are. Uh, they have their program running and they have uh, their scientists talking about what they're going to do for this sample return mission and collecting the sample. So to me, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like a manned mission, you know, they're actually digging up stuff and they're going to bring it back, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how cool is that? So that, that is, that is really awesome. Uh, let's jump uh, uh, to Tyler Bowman. Tyler, you, uh, you are getting ready for the Global Star Party tonight. Is that right? And you are muted, dude. <laughs> okay. I know that's better. There we um, go. Unfortunately, due to Arkansas weather. Oh, yeah. It was raining. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's raining. Today, yes. Um, that's right. I'll be imaging, so I'll be kind of just sitting back, soaking in the knowledge that these guys always bestow upon us. And yeah. always try to take away something new every time we have one of these. What are you um, learning uh, uh, now? I mean, the, you know, astrophotography is always a... A learning process. I know you've been working with Gary Palmer. I know that you're working on your telescope rig. What, what's new for you? Right now, I'm going to get with Mr. Uh, Tim Meyer. Um, okay. I reached out to him for some advice with Nina, uh, just to have a better understanding what I'm actually looking at, so I can plate solve, go to the target, start taking images, and not have a fuss. I want to be able to walk away from my mount and not have to babysit it like my kids. Right. Um, I mean, because that's the reason why I bought the G11 P, with the PMC8, so I do not have to babysit anything, and it can just run all night, do a flip, and keep trucking. Right. Um, and that's that's where I'm at. I'm supposed to. I'm going to get with Tim tonight while we're doing the Global Star Party, and we're going to run through some basics, make sure everything's set, the re repositories are set, the correct function. Um, sure. I have all the databases that I need, and all the ASCOM drivers that I need, which they're all downloaded, but I just need to make sure I put them in the correct spot. That way I can just click a button and go. Very cool. That's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, so basically be like you. Yeah. 
<laughs> Except well, I'm not going to burn up the camera. We are also building I'm not do a design it. system. So yeah, uh, and it's it's pretty much done. We have uh, we've got all the. Um, you know, we got the batteries, we, we did the cable management, uh, mm -hmm. Jerry integrated all the software. Uh, we got uh, our new flat field, a zero power flat field uh, yep. adapter. That thing's nice. You're you going to like that thing. That you've been testing, right? So yeah, you'll like that's, that. That's cool. Um, and uh, uh, we did, blow, I blew up the QHY 163 camera and, and so Alex fixed that. Um, so we were able to re repair a QHY camera here in-house, which was nice. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, we've been talking a lot about astrophotography. We're going to have this whole section on astrophotography on our website. Uh, it's going to include um, uh, a portal uh, for the Astronomical League on it and our association with the astrophotography there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to have, uh, we'll have a, uh, a complete line of cameras there that, uh, uh, you know, astrophotographers can select from will help them get the right combinations, the right adapters and all the rest of the stuff. So they have a system that works. Okay. And that, I think that's, that's most of what people want to get into. Yeah. Um, Cause when I started, I struggled finding the correct adapters, the spacing, it's a generic spacing, everything, it's 55 millimeters, but it's getting to that point from A to B, either with adapters or something that I'm missing, I need to help the actual customer so they don't struggle as much as I did. I mean, we all can't be like Jerry and just, it just magically works. <laughs> well, Jer Jerry struggled too at one point, I think. He, so. he did. In his book, he, he did mention some struggles, but right. um, I'm trying to alleviate that you don't want to sure. go through any of it. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm trying to alleviate that for the customer. They that's don't need why, to go through it. It's pain. All right. That's why I wrote my book too, to, to help alleviate that. So, you know, you don't have to spend weeks and weeks and months trying to find information. It's all together into one place. Right. Which Jerry, when are you going to revise that book with anything? Or are you going to, I have been asked to revise it. Uh, Springer Books did ask me to do that. Um, the, uh, quite a bit of the material is pretty, uh, pretty fundamental stuff that doesn't change. Uh, so, I, in that regard, the book's a good, good resource. There are. I'm trying to think of what specific things that would be updated. Uh, websites would probably be updated. I have links on every chapter on different websites to go to. Uh, that would probably be updated. There Where might be some. Purchase? Books. I think there would be more additions, uh, more additional stuff um, that more adds to the book as opposed to changes. I think I would add some things to the book, probably uh, newer equipment, newer techniques in terms of uh, the technology, you know, get more into the maybe start to explain some of the automation that can be added to the system, that type of stuff. Um, the book is designed to get you started as a teaching system to teach yourself astrophotography that's really what it is but then when you want to add on things that's well the second book the remote observatories book also gets into the automation and the remote controllability of the systems but uh, uh it's it's available on amazon uh, books and also springer books is the publisher i can i can bring it up on the website if you want to look at it for a second it just gives people wanting to know what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah let me. Uh... Um, and also, Scott, we're going to finalize the this week the astrophotography contest rules, right? Prizes, this is the Explore Scientific one. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, that'll right. be done this week. So everybody be on the lookout for some rules and how to enter. And it's yeah. going to be exciting times for us here. That's right. So what are the prizes going to be? Like a new car, or a houseboat. I mean, I figured Barbara Trip Jean, to, another, to the moon, <laughs> <laughs> a little tenth replica of Barbara Jean. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> no, right. Um, million dollars cash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's going to be fun though. It's going to be great. So I just, I'm, I'm sharing my screen with Spring. Oh, okay. you saw it's up all on right. the screen now. Okay, so this is the first book, Scientific Astrophotography. Um. Uh, High amateurs can generate and use professional imaging data. That was came out in 2012. And 
and show it in the inside of it here. That's the cover. And uh, you get, that's my, that's my son's drawing that he made when he was like seven years old. Of me that's funny. Out. That's great. Yeah. That's so, that's me, the intrepid amateur. Oh, I recognized you. Yeah. <laughs> What's amazing is he got Orion here. Mm hmm. I'll run where the scope's pointing at, and they got the moon, and he's got a picture of the moon on the on the computer screen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first sixty pages was basically what I've struggled with. Yeah, so yeah, so this is it's it's got three hundred some pages, but it covers. Let me see if it's got the index or the. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, the table of contents. You can see it starts out part one talks about. The imaging system and then uh, chip factors, imaging filters, astrograph and CCD camera combinations. So it talks about that, gets into environmental factors that are involved with observing. Mm -hmm. um, part two talks about integration of the system, okay. how to plan, how to plan. Uh, how you match the equipment to the science, what you, what things you need to think about if right. you want to do specific observing. Yeah. I'm always yeah. trying, you know, when people come to me and they ask me, you know, what, what, uh, what telescope should I get or whatever? I always have, try to get people to think of it backwards a little bit, you know, go all the way to, you know, what it is that you ultimately want to end up with. And then, and then right. you kind of work it backwards and you can look at, constraints such as maybe you know what how much money you can you can invest into it or uh and how much time are you willing to put into it to learn it you know that, right those kinds right. of things so right that's called we in the nuclear industry we call that the design basis for the equipment setup or for the for the equipment for the instrumentation so it's a design basis that you're observing program so i get into all that how to what's an observing program and how you do it and then, and then I've got a lot of uh, procedures, uh, a ton of procedures to show you step by step how to do things. Now, I don't know if you've got into that, Tyler, or looked at those yet. I'm a slow reader, Jerry. Wow. Mm -hmm. I like to make sure I understand it before I move on, because then there's no point of moving on. Right. So now, and then I get into image analysis. And this is uh, and how you process the images. And this is for scientific measurements. It's not for pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. um, Science is pretty pictures too. You know what's funny, Jerry? Is uh, I type in your name, Jerry Hubble. Okay, and a bunch mm -hmm. of books come down. Uh, before you get to you, uh, the Nutty Professor from 1960. Ah. Okay, from <laughs> video. So let's see. Um, <laughs> That's cool. So that's that's the book. Uh, if you want to get into how to build your system and to do to do imaging, this is what you want to. This get. is a scientific imaging book. Scientific. Yeah. Imaging. Right. Here, let me get. And there. then the other one is a remote observatory. This takes that system and then how you take that AIS, as I call it, the astronomical imaging system, there and is. then you then you build an observatory around it and what things you need. Um. For that mm -hmm. that's really critical so let me see if i got uh the, this has got a great forward by uh by rustin a he's a pioneer in remote observatories let me zoom up here uh, he was into the remote observing system building these systems in the 1980s and uh, he wrote the Ford. I'm pretty good friends with him. I haven't talked to him for a while, but he was able to. Uh, this is one of the first systems they built. Mm -hmm. uh, 1984. Oh, it's yeah. Yeah. I met him. And yeah. yeah, so he's a he's a cool guy. Um, yeah. There's another couple of systems, and they used. They didn't use them. They didn't use CCD cameras at the time. They used photometers, which are single bit. It's like having a single pixel to measure the light through an aperture. Yeah. It's just a light sensor, basically a photometer of, of uh, either a photomultiplier tube, which is was common back then, or they started selling 
I think it was was it Optech that sold a solid state photometer. I can't Optech remember. Optech sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And these are the types of systems that they were were using. So that's what that. And then that book has a lot of uh, good. That's three sections. Uh, actually, let me let me see if I can get to the to the. Uh, uh, go. I got a much shorter URL for your book. Yeah, you've got introduction to remote observatories, and then uh, that's part part one is what is a remotely controlled observatory. So that's my part that I wrote. I was there's two co-authors with this book. One is Rich Williams who owns the Sierra Stars Observatory Network, which is a commercial telescope system to rent time on. And then Linda Ballard, who was my editor for the first book, wrote uh, and gathered all the materials for the third part of the book, which I'll get into here in a minute. The second part of the book was which Rich wrote was using remote observatory facilities and how to access professional observatories around the globe. So this talks about the commercial systems and they're they're mostly they're not hands-on like the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. They're really um, uh, where you submit an observation and it does it automatically, and then it sends you back the data or gives you a, an FTP site to download the data. That's how they work. And then this is where I get into the observing program, matching your observing program to the available equipment. You know that's really uh, an important thing. Um, the third part of the book is our projects case studies. Okay. And we got, we, we were able to get a lot of good cases and a lot of good uh, material from observers all over the world on projects that they do with their remote observatories. Mm -hmm. And we broke it down to photometry, pro photometry projects. Okay. Kevin Paxson, these names might be familiar to some of you, Roger Dymock, uh, Derek Smith, uh, astrometry type projects, uh, Rob Matson, Carl Hergenrother, who's, uh, uh, he's an a ALPO. Yeah. Um, uh, he's a big guy in ALPO. He's been around for a while and look, look here, Osiris Rex target asteroids project. So that's one of the projects that we outline yeah. in the book. Yeah. Uh, and then the third one, remote astronomy education projects. There's a few of those, how, how institutions, how educational facilities use these remote ob observatories. Mm -hmm. And then aesthetic imaging projects. And, and we, we were able to get uh, Adam Block, which was a good <laughs> Oh, yeah. Then we got Sky Center well, telescopes with Adam Block. Top, huh? <laughs> yeah, so he, was a, he, he wrote a, chap, a portion and uh, submitted images for us to have in the book. So we've got pretty high high caliber people in our book demonstrating right. what you can do with these remote observatories. So that's that. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, so the, the first book came out in 2012 and the second one came out in 2015. But they're pretty, they're pretty, um, I think they're, they're valid today as they were when I wrote them. And there's a lot of good material in there for people to, people to read and learn about. Great, great. Now we were, uh, Jerry, we were talking earlier about the uh, open go to community and, um, uh, you know, the feature request list that's been building up over, and we've been talking about it most of the year. Um, right, right. Things have been building up. Uh, and, uh, and we were talking about uh, the point of where we will, um, uh, kind of pinch that off and the process that we're going to undertake to kind of vet out um, these uh, suggestions. And so can you talk to that for a little bit? Yeah, so they've, they've kind of, it's not that they petered out. We, the, we had a bunch at the beginning when I created this subgroup, but then over the last couple of months, we've only had one or two. So I think it's now it's settled down to a certain list of common of all the major ones that people have asked about, which is about, I think there's like 25 of them. And uh, I, I, I created this little PowerPoint. I want to, uh, okay. I'm going to share my, just one slide to talk about the things. I, I did it right before the show. So I want to okay. share my screen All right. on that. And uh, so do you see that? 
so the feature request evaluation, uh, Explore Stars improvements. This is this talks about Explore Stars, but it's actually the whole PMC8 system. And I'd like to break it down this way. Um, the first is customer input, suggestions, feature requests. We've got a website. We've got the web page for that, or the website for that with the, with the suggestions. And uh, so we got that. We've got a list of requests, suggestion requests right now. And then uh, problem identification and definition based on the suggestions. So each of these suggestions we have to evaluate and discuss what exactly the problem is, okay? We basically define what the root cause of the suggestion is. Why is this coming up? What is it about this particular problem? Is it a usage problem? Is it uh, an, um, an information problem? Whatever it is, we have to discuss with stakeholders. And, and what I mean by stakeholders is basically we at Explore Scientific talking with our customers saying, okay, we've got this identified problem. What is really the root cause of this problem? What do you think causes this? Or what do you think, why did this suggestion come up? Basically is what it comes down to. Right. And then once we do that for all the suggestions, then we'll group them into common areas, find related problems that are in common areas of the program or the, of the product, whatever the problem is. You might have two or three related suggestions that, that talk to this one core thing that we can improve in the product. So we have to boil it down so that we don't just try to implement three different features that are impacting the same product uh, function. You know what I'm saying? Right. Let's say we have one, one suggestion to do it this way. We have another suggestion to do it that way. We have a third one to do something else that we want to add on. We want to bring all those together. Right. So that's what this grouping process is about. And then, uh, and then we just basically, once we've grouped them, then we, when we see what the common features are, what the characteristics of the problem are. Yeah, I, and once we understand what the problem is, and then we can do a, uh, an evaluation of what the, what the actual solutions might be to that problem. And that's where we brainstorm these solutions with our customer base again. We say, okay, we've identified this problem. This is exactly what's going on. This is what we need to fix. What's the best way to solve it? Do we want to change in the, do we want to change our training? Do we want to train people to admit, to get over that problem? Do we want to add a, a display change to remind people what to do to get over the problem? Do we want to create a new function in the control system or in the explore stars to fix the problem? You know, it's a whole series of things of levels that we can do. So we can start out with the easiest level, which is to me is training and documentation right and discussion with the customer say okay this is the problem you just need to do this to manage it and you need to learn to do this to get over it training okay yeah training it's training the next thing is maybe we put something in the display that says okay you don't have this information you need to get over this problem we've added this field to say this is this is whatever and it tells you what to, uh it gives you what you need to get over the problem whether it be another an improved indicator for uh, where the object is, or an improve, it could be anything, right? It could be anything we add to the display to give you more information to help you uh, run the mount easier. And so that's what this third, this next part is: identify the simplest, easiest solution that mitigates, you know, greater than ninety percent of the problem. So there may be a problem that maybe the first 80 90 percent is easy to solve and then the last 10 percent is very difficult or costly it's a two-part thing but we can get most of the way it's like it'd be like implementing a workaround mm -hmm. that's easy to implement right that takes care of most of the problem and then it becomes a long-term resource problem if we want to really fix it the way uh, people would like to see it is it worth the resources or does the workaround solve it good enough you know, so, so as we take each one of these things, uh, what's, what is the real process going to be like? 
So the real process is going to be like we're going to we're going to look at the suggestions. There's already discussion going on for each problem, right? Each each suggestion has a thread yeah. in the features request group. So there's, there already the first part of this is being being done by discussion, by informal discussion with anybody right. that wants to wants right. to what people brainstorm what they want to chime in on, right? What right. they what they think it should be, what the problem is, what they've seen. Uh, what they think the best solution is. So that's a good block of information to bring into these different areas. And then it's up to us to start uh, categorizing this stuff and grouping it. And I've already started a, web, uh, a spreadsheet that just lists the issues and what and what the uh, verbiage is from the from the actual uh, threads, what how right. people describe the issue. What we need to do from there is take that description and really understand what the real problem is and write it down yeah what we would do and that's what this uh yeah well, some of these definition are are uh, our problems or maybe something uh, like martin eastburn here he's saying i might he say i may i might say not easiest but quickest and then full function fix eg help customers over the hump, but fix it without comps for the next release. Okay. <laughs> um, there's really nothing that you know, software that you don't have like uh, some sort of learning curve, you know, even when they change like Word on uh, Microsoft, and I've been using Word for, you know, two decades or longer, you know, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a familiarity thing, you know, and there's, some of the, the stuff becomes intuitive. Uh, sometimes there's new features that add greater power to the to the program. Some of them are genuine fixes that you know, or, or the way something worked, everybody didn't like it, or you know, uh, those kinds of things. There's a lot of there's a lot of personal preference type suggestions that exactly. you'll get. Exactly. Exactly. Now, some some of these things may be taking you know the performance of GoTo to another level, which is really that's that's great, you know. And the other part of it is, is uh, did we have enough training? Were our instructions good enough? Were uh, did was it intuitive enough? Okay, to so that you didn't have to read instructions uh, to make it work. That's that's the holy grail, right? You want to you want right. to have software that can do that. Um, but um, uh, you know, we got to. The thing is, we got to balance that with our resources and, and available time and effort yeah. to get into the thing. So that's, that's really the, the constraint. Says, uh, Mike says another consideration for feature request evaluations, resources needed, coding effort, time, money, device memory, power needed, et cetera. You know, so these are all things that come in. Um, uh, and the conversation I had earlier with Jerry was, um, you know, uh, orthogonal array uh, problem solving. You know, where you throw, you put in all of these different parameters and then you start to get to the point where uh, you can uh, enhance your product, okay, enhance the experience uh, if you can lower costs, you know, so that you can give that uh, uh, cost back to, um, uh, you know, uh, a situation where your product can be bought for a lower price that would get more people into the hobby okay right right um you know uh, simplify it, too so simplify the user right. experience that's one thing i'm working with wes on with the firmware to mitigate some of these manual controls and settings that we have to do to get different features turned on and off and things like that in the firmware we're gonna we're trying to get that automate that a little bit and and make it easier for the customer to not have to worry about so much right uh and t like like for example, switching between Wi-Fi and serial mode. Mm -hmm. That's that's well, one I, thing. I kind of sense, you know, once we get, uh, you know, we go through this process of evaluating these feature requests, uh, that uh, then we have a defined, uh, uh, you know, direction uh, and and set, you know, set of rules or whatever to uh, for the next version of Explore Stars and. Um, so we're going to be looking, uh, and because this is the open go-to community, we're going to be looking for people that really seriously want to get involved in this and work with our, you know, the top level of our engineering effort. And so if, if you are um, 
if you're someone that's uh, so interested, uh, you know, you, you can get in touch with Jerry Hubble and uh, and talk about that. Um, uh, we can, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll take you through the whole process and. Uh, uh, you know, for you know, we hope that if you get involved, it's an, an enriching experience for you. You know, uh, but um, uh, we put this out there. Um, it's it's something that uh, makes our product more user co-designed. Okay, uh, which which is really uh, really what I'd like to see in this product, and um, um, you know, and it it allows the uh, community to take greater ownership of the whole system you know so right right so we'd like to get you directly involved with working with us on the project basically on you're right. interested in that Are we, is there any particular uh skill set that we need scott that we talked about uh you know i mean one of the next ver uh, uh uh versions that we're going after right now is um you know an iphone app uh, uh, type of level, you know, so if we got people that are, you know, Apple developers at the moment, that would probably be the first need, I would think. But, uh, you know, eventually it's going to flush out through everything that we're doing. So. Right, right. So that, that's generally the process that we're going through when we do this. And, and like Scott said, we're going to be, um, we're on a continuous improvement process on all of our products and we got various release times for different things. We don't announce product, new products until we actually know that they're, they're good to go. We don't want to, we don't want to announce any vaporware or anything. Although people get an idea from our discussions about what can, what they can expect going forward. You can always expect something better going forward. That's generally what I'm going to say. Uh, Aaron Thompson says he's interested in development. Once I got my, I get my current contract well under development, I can do iOS development. And I've been a programmer for 15 years. Yeah. So Aaron, you definitely want to get in touch with Jerry. His email is jrh at explorescientific.com. Okay. Good. So I'm watching the, um, I'm watching the NASA television right now and they're kind of getting to the point of where they're showing the simulation of the uh, sample return. I'll share my screen here so that you can see. I guess it was, I guess when you read simulation, now what they're showing is the actual simulation here on Earth as it's going on in real time Yeah. at, at the asteroid. Let's see. Can I do this? Yeah. Home, there we go. It's the culmination uh, of a lot of work. It's probably one of the most exciting missions that I've worked on. It is really exciting to know that we're finally going to be able to touch the surface of the asteroid and collect the sample to return back to Earth. So step back for a moment and realize that tonight's events are exceedingly rare and historic. Humanity has only landed on a few different bodies in the solar system and actually retrieving a sample is even more rare. So luckily with me tonight are some of the people that know better than anybody all the challenges that it took to get here. So let me introduce Mike Moreau. Uh, Mike is the OSIRIS-REx Deputy Project Manager at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And Coralie Adam is Tag Navigation Manager at Kinetics Aerospace. So welcome, Mike and Coralie. How are you guys doing? So excited. I'm so excited. We're less than a half hour from Tag now. Yeah, we're, you can feel the energy all building. So I should mention at this point that it's possible, you, you've been hearing this before, cheers from the MSA. So can you give us a sense of what's going on right now? Yeah, so every few minutes, a, a navigation camera image is taken by the spacecraft at the surface below, and it's sent to the natural feature tracking system. And that system uh, identifies features in the image and sends a signal back to Earth that uh, it was successful. Position uncertainty is 0 0.5 meters. And the team celebrates. <laughs> it, it tells us we're on track to our next target and, and on track to tag. Absolutely. So now you know, clearly there's a lot to talk about in terms of the mission, but once again, you had to do all of this in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. So were there any mission expectations that changed? How did you deal with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, as the whole world was coming to grips with the pandemic and the frame, this team was in the midst of preparing for so, the first tag. So anyways, guys, uh, uh, we are, uh, so you know, this is uh, the Osiris Rex thing is pretty interesting. You're going to want to go to NASA TV um, and uh, and watch this. I'm going to 
today. We have people literally all over Stop the, the volume the here from the live stream from NASA and uh, recommend you go over there and check that out. And then at 7 o'clock, we are going to have um, the 16th Global Star Party. Um, and so uh, we've got... Um, uh, we've got a 16-year-old uh, uh, teenage girl from Nepal that she's going to be talking about uh, uh, her work in astronomy outreach, in organizing an astronomy club within our high school, and also the uh, uh, how astronomy and science is improving their developing country, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, we have the first installment of a 17-part series from David Eicher. He's the chief editor of Astronomy Magazine. He's an author of many books uh, on astronomy. And uh, he is a Civil War history uh, uh, expert. So that is, uh, he's a very interesting guy. And on top of that, he's a musician. So, um, uh, so I'm, I'm excited to have him on the show. Um, Chuck Ayub from Chuck's Astrophotography is going to be on. We've got Bob Denny, uh, developer of the ASCOM platform, he's going to be on. Uh, we've got uh, some regulars that have been on the show. Of course, David Levy, who's going to uh, kick off the whole uh, Global Star Party program. So Mike Simmons will also be joining us, um, and uh, there's others. So um, uh, we got some heavy hitters there. That gets some heavy. Well, you're one of them, so you'll be on the show too. So, <laughs> right. So, anyways, um, I will. Uh, uh, I'm going to call the show a, a close at this point, and we're going to get ready for Global Star Party. So, um, thanks for watching, and um, and we will be back on the air soon. So, take care. We just, I'm, I'm sorry about the Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, very cool. Okay. We'll make that announcement. All right. Very cool. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Take care. Bye bye. Scott.